The following is a Guadalupe Radio special presentation. So, um, like Father Will said, um, I'm supposed to talk about kind of the fathers of the church in general because this uh, part of y'all speaker series here, these first three talks are supposed to be about uh, the fathers of the church, all right? And last week you had, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, doesn't matter. Uh, you had that guy uh, talk about uh, St. Clement of Rome. You remember this, people who were here last week, right? And so he's one of the earliest um, Christian theologians that we have and actually he's the he's the author of a letter to the Corinthians and it's one of the earliest pieces of Christian literature that we have outside of the New Testament it's written like 96 98 AD all right so it's the very beginning he knows the Apostles he knows the first believers in Christ in Rome and so he gave a witness to that I'm sure it was I didn't watch the talk I'm sorry uh, but uh, I'm sure it was outstanding and you learned a lot all right and then next week's talk is um, this other bearded guy that's going to come and talk about uh, the veneration of images and the kind of the controversy that happened about was it is it licit to uh, venerate images as Christians, which was a controversy that happened in the late eighth century. All right, so we went from the first century to the eighth century in this in, you know last week to next week. So I'm going to do everything in between tonight. All right, so everything from the first to the eighth centuries. That's what we're going to cover this evening. All right, so get your notebooks out and uh, get your pens ready. You might want to get a cup of coffee after you've had all these downers now. Um, no, but what I want to do is kind of give a sense of when the church talks about the fathers of the church, what are we talking about in the first place, okay? Um, because the, the church always kind of presents the fathers as witnesses to the faith, as teachers of the faith, and so what does that mean? That's what I want to kind of get at this evening and give you a few kind of points and directions to kind of think about this way, all right? But just think about the term father to start out with. So what is a father? A father is someone who gives life. A father is someone who has a certain kind of authority within a family. And when we talk about the fathers of the church, that's who we're talking about. We're talking about the fathers. We could even talk about the mothers of the church as well because there are women theologians in the early uh, church as well. But when we talk about the fathers of the church, they're the ones who are the first witnesses to Christian faith, the first ones who are receiving the gospel and trying to figure out what it means to be a Christian. What does it mean to believe in Jesus Christ? What does it mean to be part of the church? What does it mean to live as a Christian in the world? That's what we're talking about here. And they're the first ones to start to try and figure this out. And so that's why we say that they kind of give life to the church because they start that process of reflection that we're still in 2000 years later, all right? And they have a certain authority because in those early centuries of the church, this is when the church started to figure out what do we actually believe about Christ? And when people say uh, errant things about Jesus, about God, about the human person, about the church, the fathers of the church step in and say, no, 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 this is what it means to be a Christian. This is what we believe about this and this and this. All right, we'll go through a little bit about that. But that's where that term father of the church comes from. And that's why it's so important to us to kind of have some contact with them and understand who they are. All right. Are you all hearing me? I feel like I can hear myself. All right, that very good. All right. Every once in a while, I just need you to nod, okay? Or go, oh, profound. You, know, you can close your eyes and kind of shake your head a little bit. Those, those, that's gonna be very helpful to me as I go on, okay? All right, now, when the church talks about the fathers of the church, they, kind of, they come up with four criteria, all right, to kind of, how do you categorize a particular figure as a father of the church? All right, and it's an acronym, AHO, all right? Eight, eight, what, A-H-O-E, AHO, all right? Um, that's how I remember it, at least, okay? <laughs> and so there's these four qualities. So AHO is an antiquity, holiness of life, orthodoxy of teaching, and ecclesiastical approval, okay? Those are really important words, right? Antiquity, holiness of life, orthodoxy of teaching, and ecclesiastical approval. All right, so we're gonna go through those now. What, is the, what do those mean, all right? 
I actually need to take my watch off so I can actually watch what's going on here. All right, can I put this here? Are you going to drink it if I do that, though? I got to watch my beer with these people. Okay, very are. Uh, all right, we're already 10 minutes in. That's all right. Okay, I'm going to take this back now. Okay. okay. All right. Good. All right, the first one's antiquity. All right, so just as a father has to be older than his children, right? That's a logical necessity. That makes sense to everybody, right? I don't have to prove that to anyone here, I hope. Um, so to the fathers of the church are the figures that come to us from the very first centuries of the church. They are, the, the, again, the earliest figures who are trying to think through what it means to be a Christian. Um, and so we talk about the earliest writers, teachers, bishops, theologians, from the first through the eighth centuries. That's how we're kind of demarcating the patristic period, the period of the church fathers uh, in these talks here. Um, and so I guess, you know, in one sentence then, if you have to be, then in order to consider a particular figure, a father of the church, you have to be old, all right? It has to come from the first eight centuries of the church. And so we typically demarcate kind of the very beginnings of that are the very first um, disciples of the apostles. And so again, Clement of Rome is one of those that you learned about last week. Ignatius of Antioch, Polycarp of Smyrna, you know, young families. These are great names, you know, to think Polycarp, you know, what a great name to name your child, right? Polycarp. Uh, when the brothers enter, you know, when we become Dominicans, we take on new names, you know, and I've been trying to get guys to take Polycarp for years, but it's, I think it's because they don't want to be called Poly for the rest of their life. I think that's mostly it. Um, so it begins with those figures who, again, are some of the earliest um, disciples of the apostles and are trying to figure out what it means to be a Christian. And so that goes all the way through in the West. So that is kind of the Western Europe, Italy, you know, France, Spain, um, the figures from that period all the way up to someone like Gregory the Great, who dies in 604, or someone like uh, the Venerable Bede, another great name, English. All right, he dies in 735. Uh, and then in the East, we typically talk about the fathers kind of extending to the period up to the 750s and 780s even, all right? So like the last figure of the fathers of the church in the East, we usually talk about St. John Damascene. So that means St. John of Damascus. And what's really interesting about him is that he grew up in a Christian family in Damascus, but under Islamic rule in Syria. And so what's really interesting is that him and the figures that surround him, like what does it mean to be a Christian surrounded by Islam? You know, and they're some of the first reactions to Islam. So we think the things that we deal with in the 21st century are new. It's not, all right? These people thought about these things before. And that's why we want to read the fathers. That's why we want to kind of come to understand them because there's nothing new under the sun, all right? And uh, the fathers have thought about these things and, and uh, contemplated these things and they've handed them on for us to figure out. But that's all to say. We talk about the fathers of the church. We're kind of going through the end of the eighth century before you come to what's called usually the medieval period. And we usually begin the medieval period with Charlemagne. You've heard of Charlemagne, right? All right. And so he's crowned Holy Roman Emperor on Christmas Day in 800. So that's a really easy date to remember. And that's kind of the beginning of the medieval period. But anything before that in Christian history, these are the fathers of the church. And they're the ones that we look to for the very beginnings of what it means to be a Christian. All right. Uh, and also, it's not just, again, being old, but it's that um, we have to believe when we look at the kind of history of the church, we don't just want to see it as just like one event after another. This guy did this and reacted to this and this person did this and there was this war. And this person exiled this person, whatever. All right. But we also want to see that God in his providence throughout history, he raises up people, gives them particular grace, gives them particular gifts to serve the church in a very particular way. And so when we look at certain centuries and say, hey, here's the time when the church is trying to understand what it means that God is one, but exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When we say that Christ is one, but he's both human and divine. What it means that we can worship images, say, but things that are created, but nonetheless give us contact to God. God raises up certain theologians, certain minds in the history of the church providentially to defend these truths so that he can continue to reveal himself in time. Does that make sense? And this happens throughout the entire history of the church. And so when we, you know, look to the, you know, when you look to the Middle Ages, you have the greatest theologian of all time, St. Thomas Aquinas, who was a Dominican. Uh, you see that God raised up a particular mind to serve the church at a particular time, you know? And you could even look to the 20th century and say, look, there are certain theologians, certain times and places. You can look at the councils of the church, the Second Vatican Council, for example, and say, no, God's inspiring certain people to say certain things so that God can reveal himself 
in them and in that time. Does that make sense? So that's why we look to these guys in the very beginning uh, of the church because they're the first ones to figure this stuff out. They're the first ones to think this. And we think that God's actually given them something that he wants to communicate to his church over time. And that's why we love them. That's why we want to read them and study them that way. Okay? Does it make sense? So it's not just being old. Antiquity also has to do with God's providential plan for this. All right. So that's, that's the first, that's A in aho. All right? Uh, the H here is holiness of life. Because when we study the history of the fathers of the church, they're not just eggheads. They're not just really smart guys who came up with really interesting things. We call most of them saint, in fact. If you think about the great fathers of the church, it's Saint Ignatius of Antioch, it's Saint Athanasius, it's Saint Augustine, it's Saint Cyril of Alexandria, it's Saint Leo. We could keep on going, you know? Um, because they're not, again, just the church's kind of intellectuals, but they lived what they preached. The realities that they defined and that they spent time trying to figure out how, what makes sense, again, about God, about Christ, about the church, about the world, about the human person, these are things that they themselves experienced and lived and actually gave their life to. And to give your whole life to God and to allow Him to live in you and live for Him, that's just what it means to be a saint. And so when we look at the fathers of the church, if we're going to call someone a father of the church, we're always going to look to, are they actually living what they talk about? Because this is always, in any age of the church, the, the testimony to the, uh, to the truth of what they preach, of what they teach. All right? Uh, because again, someone's faith and the truth of what they believe has its best confirmation and testimony in the lives that they lived. Um, there's a great theologian in the fourth century named Avagrius of Ponticus, another great name. <laughs> you had a son named Avagrius. That's so much more interesting than like even Austin, right? Or William. I mean, like everyone's named William. Like who cares? But Evagrius, Polycarp, Vigilius, these are great. Quadvolt Deus, these are great names, all right? I can give you the list afterward, young parents. It's not too late, right? He's only two weeks old. We can rename him. Yep, at the baptism, it's no problem. But Evagrius of Ponticus, he writes this. He says, if you're a theologian, you truly pray. And if you truly pray, you're a theologian. So we think of theologians, again, as these academic types, people who have gone off and done doctorates in theology and teach in a seminary and that sort of thing. But in the early church, to be a theologian just meant you have real contact with God and you say true things about God and you can defend those true things about God. That's what it means to be a theologian. That's what it means to be a father of the church. All right, and so we always look at the holiness of life of these people and say, did they live out what they, what they uh, taught and what they said? Another way to think about this is that we look to the, um, the fathers of the church to be wise figures, wise guides. And that name, that, that word wise doesn't just mean smart, right? When we talk about someone being wise, we don't just mean that they're smart. We actually kind of usually mean that they're not smart in world's, the world's terms. That wise means something different. We mean, it means that they, they have some sort of lived experience of the things that they talk about, right? I think about my grandma. She went to high school, and that was it. Like, she didn't go to college, right? But my grandma's wise. She knows stuff. She knows people. She knows how to deal with things, right? And that comes, you know, in Latin, the word for wisdom is sapientia. And the root of that sapientia is the word sapor, which means taste. And so the ancients, when they thought about, thought about wisdom, they're like, oh, here's someone who has a taste of something. They know it, they've lived it, they've experienced it. And when we talk about the fathers of the church, again, they're not just smart people who came up with really interesting, intricate theories about things, but that they experienced God. They knew him and they were able to speak. They were able to defend those truths against people who wanted to say something different somehow. All right? And so they have a certain wisdom. So I think it's a really interesting way to think about holiness, that holiness is a sort of wisdom. It's a sort of experience of God knowing him uh, experientially, you know, in our bones. Also, when we talk about the holiness of the lives of the fathers, um, we also want to remember that, you know, the saints and the fathers of the church are real people. They lived real lives, real, in real places, in real times. You, know, you go to church and you see these like statues of saints or you see paintings of saints and they just kind of look perfect, right? They kind of look like me actually, right? Uh, kind of dressed up, uh, you know, kind of dressed up weird, you know, kind of out of place somehow. 
Um, but that doesn't help us realize that these people lived in a real time and place. And they had to deal with real life. And they experienced the same God that you and I can experience in our real lives, in our real times, in our real places. What they did was extraordinary, but it's not impossible to us. And this is the case with the saints always. This is why we celebrate the saints, all right? We look back to the, we don't think of them as like little demigods or something like this. Like you'll sometimes, you know, when you talk to Protestants, sometimes they say, well, you people just worship Mary and the saints. It's like, no, we don't. It's that these people are our family. And they're the ones who have lived this life. And we want to look to them and see, how did they live that thing? They give me hope. They give me strength that I can do that too, because they lived in a real time and place. And one of the great joys of studying the early history of the church, uh, the fathers of the church, which I've gotten the privilege of doing these last several years, um, is that you get to know their times and their places, and you see the real ways that they interacted with their own time and place, and to see how God worked through them, spoke through them, revealed himself through them. And the hope in learning these things and studying them and really being edified by them is that God's going to do that through me and you right here and right now. That's the idea, okay? And we want to be faithful to what they were given so that God can give the same thing to us. All right, so that's holiness of life. Is that all right? We got that so far? So, aho, we've done A, H, now we're going to O, all right? So, O is orthodoxy of teaching, okay? Let's get clear what we mean that way. First thing is this. Uh, it means, first of all, that we have writings of the church fathers, okay? There may be great saints um, that we celebrate as saints from the early church, but they're not fathers unless we have something that they taught, that they wrote, that they defended, all right? Because that's, that's what it means uh, in this context to be a father, is that they teach us something somehow. And so for some of the fathers of the church, uh, like figures like St. Augustine, like St. John Chrysostom, um, you know, we have bookshelves full of stuff. You know, someone famously said that if you say that you've read all of St. Augustine, you're a liar, you know? Um, because it's hard to imagine that he could have written everything uh, that he did in his life, much less someone else read it in theirs, you know? Uh, but like St. John Chrysostom commented on every part of the New Testament, and we've got all of that. We've got all these other treatises that way. But then there's other uh, fathers of the church that we have like one little letter, you know, that they wrote to someone, or a treatise, like a little, you know, article that they wrote, or a speech that they gave, or a sermon that they delivered that way. But that teaching has been found to be part of the deposit of the church's teaching over time, and it's useful for explaining the mysteries of the faith, all right? And so, uh, again, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, I know you're all familiar with that big brick of a book, you know, um, it cites a lot of the fathers of the church, you know, who I'm kind of talking about tonight. Uh, and sometimes, you know, it's just like one little work that we have, but that's like a really definitive time and place and a way of thinking about God that was really helpful to the church. And so the Catechism puts it in there so that we can know that and learn from that, all right? Um, so, it means that we have to have some sort of teaching, and then when that teaching is read, and analyzed and studied, it's found to be orthodox. All right, so we wanna be clear about what this term orthodox means, all right? Um, we wanna say in this context that orthodoxy means that they are teaching has a sort of rightness to it, a correctness to it, that we think that it teaches correctly concerning God, Christ, the church, the world, the human person. And orthodox just comes from two Greek words, all right? So orthos in Greek just means right or correct, all right? And doxa means opinion, all right? Or way of thinking, doxa, all right? And so it's the right way of thinking about something, all right? So when you go to your next cocktail party later tonight, you can say, hey, do you know what the etymology of orthodoxy is? Because I do. So enjoy that, you know? But when we read the fathers of the church who are given to us by the church as fathers, we can be assured that we're being given the truth. This is one of the really helpful things, again, about being Catholic, is that we've got these teachers throughout 2,000 years of history, but particularly from the patristic age, we can know, if I want to know what the church teaches about this or that, I know I can go to these figures and know that I'm receiving what the church teaches here. The catechism is a really helpful tool to point us in that direction, um, and then really smart priests like Father Will and myself, we can also <laughs> point you to these things, all right? Um, one thing that we want to say kind of historically, though, is that orthodoxy is a thing that develops over time. The church kind of develops her teaching, comes to understand more profoundly who God is, who Christ is, what the church is, what the human person is over time. 
And certain earlier figures sometimes will say something or teach something that's like, oh, it's a little obscure, it's a little ambiguous, sometimes it's just wrong, you know? Um, and a father can certainly be seen as orthodox in his own time uh, while he teaches things that need to be corrected later in this way. And that's why you have to have a little bit of a historical consciousness when you're reading the fathers and just kind of say, look, you know, um, we're gonna talk about the Council of Nicaea in 325 in a few minutes, all right? And that council it developed the creed that we say every Sunday, you know, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, but there are theologians who before that council came about and came about with that creed, said things that were a little kind of ambiguous that way. And so it's the part, it's the job of theologians to kind of say, okay, when they're talking in the second century about this or that, are they contradicting what the church says later? Or is it a way of understanding a sort of progression here? So that's the difficulty here, you know? But when the church cites a church father, when the church says, no, 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 here's what the church means about the life of grace or something like that, we know that we can rely on these figures that the church gives us. All right, does that make sense? Just wanna be a little historical every once in a while as well. All right, All right so that's H, no, that's O. Oh, orthodoxy of teaching. Oh, all right. Now we're at E, okay? And this is ecclesiastical approval. Uh, and it goes a little bit with orthodoxy of teaching as well. Um, often the church's approval of a father of the church comes by way of canonization. We call them saint, all right? Or sometimes the church will declare a certain figure a doctor of the church. You've heard this term before, all right? There are these doctors, there's more doctors now. When I was growing up, there were 33. Now there's like 37, eight. How many, Will, do you know? No. All right. Father Will and I don't know, but um, it's like 30 something, okay? Because uh, they keep on making them and they don't ask our opinions about it, okay? So um, that's all to say, when the church declares someone a doctor of the church, when, someone can, when they're canonized from the patristic era, um, there's a certain approval that the church is giving to that person, right? As a testimony of Christian life, and also as a sort of stamp of approval on their teaching that way, okay? Um, so for example, the church has done this over the centuries and kind of named kind of like, uh, like the superstar fathers, you know, in the East and the West. And so like in the West, the superstar fathers are St. Ambrose, St. Augustine, St. Jerome, St. Gregory the Great. You've heard these names before, right? As names, they're okay. Ambrose, that's a cool name actually. You can name your son Ambrose if you want to, all right? Um, in the East, there are kind of the four kind of superstar doctors of the church in the East. Names, uh, their names are St. Gregory of Nazianzus. Gregory, it's a pretty great name. St. Basil, I don't hear that name very often, it's a great one. St. John Chrysostom. Chrysostom's really a title. It just means golden mouth, all right? So you can name your son Chrysostom, okay? That's an idea. And then St. Athanasius, that's a great name. Oh yeah. And Athanasius is just the masculine form of the noun, which means resurrection. You know, so you name your child after the resurrection. That's great, right? You want to do that. Okay. Um, so, you know, the church will kind of raise up these certain doctors who are going to say their teaching is authoritative for what it means to be a Christian, what we believe. Um, now, when the church will uh, uh, kind of approve certain theologians but not canonize them or make them a doctor, it often signals that there's some ambiguity about their teaching, all right? You're learning a lot here right now, okay? Uh, so there's a couple examples from the early church from before the Council of Nicaea even that are kind of ambiguous this way. So the first one is a guy named Tertullian, all right? Another great name, all right? Tertullian. So Tertullian was a theologian in North Africa in the early part of the third century, the most brilliant kind of lawyer and kind of politician really uh, of North Africa at the time. And he developed, you know, when we talk about that there's one God and three persons, we use that term person, that comes from Tertullian, all right? When we say that Christ is one person but exists in two natures, that vocabulary starts with Tertullian, okay? Uh, but he joined a sort of charismatic movement called the Montanists, all right? They actually called themselves the New Prophecy, which it sounds like a sort of storefront church, right? I come from Kentucky where there's a lot of these things. But anyway, in Kentucky, you would have like a church that some group would say like, we don't want to be part of Sixth Baptist Church anymore. We're going to go form the New Prophecy, you know? So Tertullian joined one of these groups, okay? It was a sort of charismatic group that said, if you're going to be a Christian, you got to be really serious. And you can't eat meat and you're not going to get married and, you know, really kind of strict sort of stuff. That's not part of Christianity. Christian orthodoxy this way, all right? And so this is why the church did not ultimately canonize him and didn't kind of put him forward as a doctor and even as a father, but he comes from that period where that vocabulary and those concepts are coming about, you know? And the church will use that because the church is always happy to look and say, hey, when we find something true, 
we'll use that. And then if you say something that's not true, we won't use that. Because we're not scared of this, you know? We're going to look for truth wherever it can be found, because we know the God who is true, you know? And so we can read Tertullian and, and see those things. Another figure we're going to talk about in just a second is Origen of Alexandria is a big deal this way. And he, again, is one of the most important theologians of the early churches, of a famous modern scholar who says that all of Christian theology is just a footnote to Origen, okay? Uh, so it just tells you he's super influential and important. But he had some crazy ideas. He kind of thought, of, he thought reincarnation was a thing, you know? Uh, he thought at the end of time, all people will be saved, even the devil, doesn't rem it doesn't matter, you know? And he had good reasons for thinking that, but the church said, uh, when we read the Bible, when we understand who God is, we don't actually think those things are true. And so we kind of put these guys to the side, even though we're willing to read them this way, all right? So in that sense, they're not fathers of the church, they're what we will call ecclesiastical authors, all right? It's kind of a sort of euphemism, right? Uh, it's kind of like, yeah, you're not one of the fathers, but you're useful every once in a while, so we'll drag you out whenever we need you, you know, in that sense. But the church can approve a theologian in lots of different ways. So, um, you know, in the official prayer of the church called the Liturgy of the Hours, there's this part of the Liturgy of the Hours called the Office of Reading, which priests and nuns do, on a, and a lot of lay people also pray it. Um, and there's an office there called the Office of Readings, and every day we have a little like two-page reflection from the church fathers that we read. If you read the Magnificat, you know, if you heard about the, raise your hand if you heard about the Magnificat. You know Dominicans run that, by the way, just to be clear, right? All right, um, you know, in there often you're getting the fathers of the church in there, you know, and this way. And so when, when you have uh, the church um, include the writings of certain fathers, there's a certain approval there, or in certain church documents, certain church councils, their writings are approved. And so uh, there's a sort of approval process that goes on with that. You know, all right, so they have to be approved by the church. It's not just Father Austin saying, oh no, this is a father of the church, you gotta listen to him. No, we look to what the church says, you know, this way. All right, so that's a hoe, all right? You've got that, you're gonna put that on your bathroom mirror to memorize for tomorrow, okay? It's a useful thing to do, actually. If you just try to memorize one little thing every day, you learn a lot, you know, over time. And then you also forget a lot. Okay, so that's what, when the church talks about the fathers of the church, I hope it's clearer than it was before, right? Okay, I've got some nodding heads, thank you. Even if it's not, just keep nodding your head. You're really helping me out right through here, okay? All right. I wanna make three kind of general points about the fathers of the church now, and kind of give a sense of like, what's the feel of the writings of the fathers of the church. What kind of things are they doing? How are they thinking about things, all right? Because I can't do 700, 800 years of history right now, okay? Just to relieve you, all right? Because we gotta be done by like seven o'clock anyway, it doesn't matter, all right? Um, all right, so the three points I wanna make tonight is that the fathers of the church first read the Bible differently than we do. And it's really interesting and it's really important that we get in touch with that and ask ourselves kind of, uh, how do we get in touch with what they were doing with the Bible, all right? Second of all is that there's a unity of the way that they think about theology, the way they think about God and the world, the human person, everything like that. There's a, it all comes together, all right? And I'll, make, I'll explain why I want to say that that's important. And then the third, this is another great cocktail party word, they have a soteriological motivation. Soteriological motivation. All right, so I'll explain what all those things mean, all right? So first of all, let's talk about the Bible, all right? Um, the fathers of the church, when they want to know what God has revealed about something, they read the Bible. This may seem obvious, okay? Um, but, but, but particularly in the modern world, I think in, in a country which is heavily, heavily, uh, heavily Protestant this way, you kind of think Catholics, we don't read the Bible, that's what Protestants do. It's like, no, that's not true actually, okay? Um, and we don't want to let them get away with that, okay? Um, it's also really important to remember that, um, again, the fathers of the church are the first ones, they're the first Christians to read the Bible and try to understand what God's revealing in the Bible, all right? And again, St. Clement of Rome, whom you heard about last week, um, you know, he knew the apostles, he knew their teachings, he knew the letters of St. Paul, he knew the gospels, he's quoting them there, you know? He's the first one to do this. Uh, but what's really interesting to understand is that the church produces the Bible. It's not that the Bible produces the church. All right? Does that make sense? Do you see what I'm saying there? The church produces the Bible, not the Bible the church. This is kind of a really fundamental 
thing that we have indifference, I think, with the, the sort of ethos of a lot of our Protestant brothers and sisters this way. Because what happened is that you had these writings, these inspired writings from the apostles and the first generation of the church. And then in the subsequent generations, it was the fathers of the church who said, no, 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 this letter, yes, this says true things about God. That weird gospel of Thomas or whatever like that, we're not going to read that because it says untrue things about God. All right. And this is where the Bible comes from, is where the church said, no, here are the writings that actually reveal who God is to us, reveal what the church is, reveal who we are as human beings in God that way. All right. And so the church sees the Bible, first and foremost, as the word of God. And again, we think about that. But as modern people, I can tell you this, all right, uh, as modern people, we tend to think about the Bible as what? A historical document. And it comes from, you know, 3,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago this way. And there's a whole kind of different manuscript tradition. There's lots of other people who kind of had hands in it this way. And it's a library of different works this way. The fathers of the church didn't think that way. The fathers of the church said, yes, these writings come from different times and places. The Old Testament comes from Israel. The New Testament comes from different places in early Christianity. But it's all one book. And it has one author. And that's the Holy Spirit. And so when we read the words of the Bible, we're reading the words that God wants to reveal to us. When I want to know what God thinks about something, I can go there and hear him speak. And so they spend a lot of time with the Bible. And actually, every time they are going to do something theological, they're going to read the Bible. But I'll talk about that in the next point. All right. Because I want to talk about real quickly, kind of how did, how then did they start to read the Bible? And this came out of a particular controversy or a particular set of questions that came up in the early part of the third century with someone named Origen of Alexandria. So Origen is O-R-I-G-E-N. All right. Origen of Alexandria. Um, Origen is born into a Christian family in Alexandria in Egypt, which Alexandria was the sort of intellectual capital of the Roman Empire at this time in history. All right. So if you were an egghead, if you were really smart, that's where you went to study. Okay. It's like going to Harvard. Okay. That's like Alexandria was Cambridge, Massachusetts. That's where you went to study. All right. And Origen comes out of a Christian family. His father, Leonides, another great name, Leonides. Ooh. Uh, Leonides uh, was also a scholar, uh, was very well versed uh, in scripture, uh, as also as a philosopher, um, and he was arrested for being a Christian, and he was executed. So he was a martyr in the early part of the third century under the emperor Septimus Severus. All right, that's not a great name for your child, right? Don't name your child Septimus Severus, okay? Um, but around the year like 202, we think, uh, he, was, he was martyred, and Origen talks about this in some of his writings and how deeply affected he was by the idea that his father would go out there and give testimony to Christ with his blood, with his life, you know? And so soon after that, they were rounding up Christians again in Alexandria. And so he said, all right, I'm going. I'm going to go get arrested and get executed for the faith. And his mother, being a good mother, hid his clothes so he couldn't go out, all right, and kept him home. Uh, so we're really grateful because he's one of the most influential fathers of the church, right? So we're really grateful for that. that he does. We're always really grateful for good moms uh, in this sense. Talk about a mother of the church. Like she's just as important as Origen in that sense, you know, if you would think about it that way. But Origen entered what was called the catechetical school of Alexandria. Now that's not just like Sunday school in Alexandria, okay? The catechetical school was like a graduate school of theology. And in, the, and in the Christian world, it was the place you went if you wanted to study at the highest level what it means to be a Christian, what scripture says, what theology says. This is where you went, all right? So Origen enters this school and he quickly becomes a teacher and he quickly becomes the head of that at a certain point, all right? And in the process of that, one of his tasks was that he, was, he had to kind of give lectures and comment on the entire Bible, which is what he did, all right? And so he gave all of these lectures, and we don't have very many of them that have survived over the centuries uh, for several reasons we can get into later if you're really interested. Uh, but, uh, but like when he comments on the very beginning of the Gospel of John, you've read this before. We just heard this at Christmas if you were at Mass on Christmas Day, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, the Word was with God, right? All right. He takes apart every single word of that and writes pages on like every single word, all right? And it goes on like this for hundreds of pages, 
all right? And nerdy people like me have to sit there and read them, you know, and figure out what he's saying here. But he did that for the entirety of the Bible, all right? Uh, and so this was one of his jobs. And he also wrote other books this way. But what I want to kind of zero in when with Origen is, again, the way that he read scripture was very particular. And that when he was reading particularly the Old Testament, there was a question for people in Alexandria. That is, people who were not originally Jewish, who were Gentiles, pagans, all right, who became Christians. But then as they became Christians, they saw that Christians, particularly Jewish Christians, Jewish converts to Christianity, really held the Old Testament in reverence, right? And they didn't get that because they're like, why would I care about this old book for this other religion that I'm not part of, right? These are stories and writings of people that I'm not Jewish, and this happened way over there, you know, even in Egypt, like, you know, uh, Palestine is way over there, you know, comparatively. And they said, why do I care about this stuff? Particularly when you read the New Testament and St. Paul says things like, you know, the letter kills, the spirit gives life, the old law is dead, the new law gives life, you know, these sorts of things. Why would I care about that? All right. And so what Origen in particular and the kind of school that surrounds him, they came up with and they said, no, 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 no. The same God who reveals himself in Israel, the same God who reveals himself in the Old Testament is the same one in the New Testament. And so if he spoke to the Jews, if he spoke to Israel through the Old Testament, through Genesis, through Exodus, through Leviticus, through the prophets, through the Psalms, we want to see in what he's, we want to see what God's saying there. And as Christians, we're going to read this thing differently because anything that is said by God in the Old Testament, we believe speaks explicitly of Christ. And so we're going to develop techniques. And this is what Origen did, again, in these graduate seminars, if you want to think about it that way, about how to read the Old Testament and to see Christ prefigured, revealed already in the Old Testament. All right, so I'm gonna give you two examples of that. All right, so stick with me here, all right? Um, so ha you people have heard of the Song of Songs. This is a, bo a book in the Bible, right? Have you read the Song of Songs? It's outstanding, right? It's racy stuff. It's like the erotic love poetry of the Bible, right? So if you haven't read this, go home. But you're not gonna be able to go to sleep, so it's, it's, it's tough. It's racy stuff, okay? Uh, and, and the story in the, in the Song of Songs, it describes the lover and her beloved and how she was unfaithful to the beloved, but then sought after him and he takes her back and they kind of reestablish their relationship, okay? So this is this love poetry. And you know, it talks about, you know, my lover is leaping like a gazelle and he's peering through the lattices. You know, things like husbands say to their wives, you know, uh, these sorts of things, you know? All right, so this is in the Bible, by the way, you know? But Origen's reading that and he goes, okay, but this is speaking of Christ, how? The lover here, is Christ and the beloved is the human soul and so he goes through every passage of the Song of Songs to see this is how God seeks us out it's like a young man pursuing his bride you know all right that's not the literal sense of that text right at all but a Christian is able to say ah here's the dynamics of our faith being sort of predicted in this book of the Old Testament all right it's much more interesting than saying, well, this was written in the 8th century BC, you know, that's what, who cares, right? But it's like, oh wow, this is about me. This is about Christ who loves me and is seeking me out here. And this is what Origen does, all right? Also, when he reads um, the Exodus, all right? So we're familiar with the Exodus story, right? Israel's brought out of Egypt by Moses. They're led through the desert for 40 years. They go to the promised land. And Origen says, this is the Christian spiritual life. Each one of us is brought out of Egypt, which represents our sinfulness, and we're brought on this journey, this 40-year journey in different stages. And every little city, every little thing that happens along the Exodus, he interprets and says, yeah, these are the sorts of things that happen in an allegorical way. That's the fancy word for it, all right? In a sort of uh, figurative or symbolic way, what happens to the Christian soul over time. Does that make sense? This is what Origen does, and he kind of saves the Old Testament for the church. Because there have been theologians for the hundred years before that saying, no, no, Old Testament, who cares? Let's get rid of that stuff, you know. And Origen says, no, 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 this is deeply important for us. And he develops this way of reading, all right? And this is the way Christians read the Bible really until like the 19th century, all right? So from now on, Father Will, when he preaches in the Old Testament, he's going to start talking about, you know, um, the gazelle leaping and peering <laughs> and that Christ is looking for your soul, I only you know. I care about the gazelle. 
yeah, he's, he loves a good gazelle. All right. Okay, so that's how the fathers read the Bible. And so uh, if you're feeling inspired or interested this way, there are kind of commentaries of the fathers on the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, but also parts of the New Testament and that sort of thing. They're very easy to find in English translation. Uh, and I've got a book recommendation for you at the end, which can point you in this direction as well. All right? But just, I hope that's interesting to you because I find that fascinating and really interesting. Um, all right, so that's the first point, how to read the Bible. The second is the unity of theological thought, all right? So what I mean by this, it, it, what do I mean by that is this. Uh, if you go off and study theology in graduate school today, at the very first day, you have to decide what kind of theology am I studying? Am I doing dogmatic, systematic theology? Am I doing moral theology? Am I doing biblical theology? Am I doing pastoral theology? Am I doing canon law? Am I doing liturgical theology? We have these little disciplines, right? All right. Uh, the fathers of the church would have no clue what you're talking about. They didn't do that because for them, God is one and theology is one. Our understanding of what it, uh, of who God is, is all one. Because what we believe, how we live, how we worship, how we read the Bible, these are all one. It's all part of a complete life, all right? And this is how the fathers of the church do things, okay? Um, and so whatever they're doing theology, you know, you might be reading something on uh, the Gospel of John and then St. Augustine goes on in this long thing about Trinitarian processions and how the Father, you know, uh, kind of gives forth the Son and they give forth the Spirit and they're just like, wait, 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 what are you talking, that, like, that's not, it's like, yeah, St. Augustine's like, no, that's what St. John's talking about here. It's all the same for him. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, so let me give you another example of this. So this, what I want to take is St. Augustine, actually, as an example. So everyone's heard of St. Augustine of Hippo, right, before, all right. He's probably the most important theologian of the early church. So Origins maybe the most influential, Augustine's maybe the most important, or maybe you can switch those two things. I don't care how you want to think about it, but uh, Augustine's super important, all right. So he, he lives, uh, he's born in 359 and dies in 430, okay. He's born in North Africa. Uh, and also, when we think about North Africa, um, uh, we have to remember that North Africa was Roman, okay? So particularly the kind of the parts, like kind of modern day Libya, Algeria, Morocco, this was all Roman settlement. They spoke Latin, and they had a Latin kind of, almost kind of Italian culture, okay, there. And that's what St. Augustine comes out of. Um, he was born to a pagan father, but a Christian mother named Monica, who's one of the most fascinating figures in the early church, okay? And St. Augustine is kind of a wild child. So if you want to read, again, something racy, all right, um, you read the, the Confessions of St. Augustine. All right, this is one of the most famous books in Western literature, right? But the Confessions of St. Augustine, the first eight books, whoa, he talks about his early life and it's wild, wacky stuff, okay? Um, and what he does in that book, though, he's talking about his sort of past where, you know, you name it, he did it, you know? Uh, but then he took a new job as what they, in the Romans, they called them a rhetor or a rhetoress. And uh, this was kind of like a mix between a lawyer and a politician because you would give speeches, you would kind of be hired to give speeches. I guess he's a speech writer, I should just say that. But he would also give them. Um, and he would do this on, the, on behalf of the emperor or some public official of some sort, all right? And so Augustine is hired to go do this in Milan. So that's in northwestern Italy, all right? And when he goes there, he's not a Christian yet. All right. Although his mother really wanted him to become a Christian at this point. Um, and he had kind of uh, dabbled in other religions at this point. But he hears the preaching of a guy named St. Ambrose of Milan. St. Ambrose is another fascinating figure. He's born in 339, dies in 390, uh, 397. And uh, St. Ambrose was another rhetor, so this kind of lawyer, politician kind of person. Uh, and he was sent to Milan, you know, decades before Augustine to take up a similar kind of job. But when uh, Ambrose shows up into Milan, the local Christian bishop had just died. And in the ancient church, you didn't wait for the Pope to give you a new bishop. The local clergy and people of the diocese would get together and just elect someone, their bishop, all right? So they, we would say Father Will for bishop, you know? Uh, and then we would all raise our hands and it would happen, you know, just like that, okay? So this is what happened to Ambrose. Ambrose comes to take this new job. The bishop had just died. They said, Ambrose for bishop. They said, yep, let's do it. The problem was Ambrose wasn't a Christian. And so they had to baptize him and ordain him and then make him a bishop. But he became one of the great bishops of the early church, so it's fine. And he baptizes Augustine decades later. 
all right? And if you go to Milan, there's the really beautiful cathedral with all the little spires, you know, and, and, and um, uh, the main square there. Uh, you can go down under the cathedral there and you can see the baptistry where St. Augustine was baptized. It still exists there. All right, so I went there and had a little cry, you know. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's so beautiful to kind of think that this happened there. All right, so that's Augustine. So after he's baptized, he says, all right, I'm leaving the world. I'm going to become a monk. He and some of his friends go become monks, all right? And they form a little monastery and they read books and they say prayers and they eat vegetables and, you know, this sort of thing all day, all right? Um, and he moves down to North Africa to his home to do this and to kind of live this life. And then people start hearing about him because he's a bright boy. And he starts writing things. He starts writing little letters, treatises, comments on the Bible. And the local bishop says, all right, I'm going to ordain you a priest. And in those days, it was more coercive. You know, like there was no discernment. You know, you didn't go to seminary. It was just like, no, the bishop's like, you're good. All right, come here. And then we kind of ordain you. And then you would start preaching and taking over parishes and that sort of thing. All right. Uh, I think it's probably better, frankly, back then, but that's my opinion, all right. Um, so Augustine uh, becomes a priest and eventually becomes a bishop of Hippo, Hippo Regis, which is the second, second biggest city in North Africa in the fourth century, all right. Uh, and he himself, right, again, he's written so much stuff that it takes up bookshelves, and again, anyone who says they've read all of Augustine is lying. There's no way, you know, it's just, it's impossible. Um, but uh, and he writes about kind of everything. He does commentaries on scripture. He writes letters. He writes kind of treatises where he kind of systematically takes things. He writes one of the most famous books trying to understand what the Trinity is. It's called On the Trinity. They didn't have great names back then, okay, but <laughs> On the Trinity, all right. Um, he also wrote a book like, what does it mean to be a Christian in the world where the world isn't our home? The world isn't our vocation and heaven is our vocation, but we live here, right here and right now. And that's a book called The City of God. And it's an outstanding book. It's long and it's a slog, but gosh, it's beautiful as well. Right? He's trying to figure out what does that mean. But I just want to take a little example here because what happens to St. Augustine early in his priesthood, uh, for, first of all, when the bishop said, I'm going to ordain you a priest, he's like, look, I need to go study. Like I haven't studied enough, which wasn't true. I think he was just kind of being humble. You know, he's like, I really need to go study the Bible because I'm going to have to start preaching now. So he does that and he goes away and he studies the Bible. He really reads the letters of St. Paul in particular. And in the course of that study, he comes across this line in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, where it says, what do you have that you haven't received? And he sits back and thinks about that. He's like, what does that mean? And he goes on and on about this in a number of different writings of his. And he starts to see that actually in the Christian life and just in our life as creatures, every single thing that, we, that is our life, our family, our beer, everything, this is literally a gift, actually, um, <laughs> from you people, I think, um, that everything is a gift. We don't earn anything. We don't merit anything. And when we talk about our salvation, the grace that God gives us, that too, first and foremost, is the great gift of God. Because what is grace? This is the definition that comes from St. Augustine. Grace just is the creature's participation in the very life of God. We can't deserve that. We can't earn that. We can only receive that. And where do we receive that? We receive that in the sacraments of the church. When we go to worship God, we receive the sacrament of new life in baptism, forgiveness in confession, the real presence of God in our hearts in the Eucharist. This is where we receive the grace that God wants to give us in his church that he has founded, which is his body that he gives to us gratuitously and freely. So just notice in there, all right? So all of that first starts with the Bible, and we start saying things about who God is, who we are, how God works with us, how we're supposed to worship him, and what the church looks like, all in one go, all right? And that's how the fathers of the church go, all right? Because in modern theology, like even Father Will and I were talking about, I'm teaching the theology of grace at the House Studies next semester, which is not my expertise. And Father Will goes, yeah, that's not my world either, you know? Because that's not what he studied in graduate school. Okay, now Father Will could teach a fine class on that, all right? Um, but it, even in the modern day, and even with Catholic theologians, we kind of segment ourselves. And if someone gave me like a New Testament class to teach, I'd be like, oh my gosh, I gotta go really work on this thing. This is not my stuff, you know? In the, old, in the, in the ancient church, no one thought that way. They said, no, we're gonna talk about God. We're going to read the Bible. We're going to see what, we, what that means, who God is. How are we supposed to live in response to that reality? How are we going to worship him because of, all of that came together for them? And I think that's just a much more beautiful way of thinking about the faith rather than like, I'm, a, you know, I'm an expert in this discipline and I can't talk about these other things. Okay? Does that make sense? That's what I'm going to say about that. Ooh, okay. Last point here. All right? 
I really didn't think I was going to talk this long, Will, but you gave me two beers before this, so. Not going to be the last one either, okay? It's fine. Okay. So the last one is what I want to say, a soteriological motivation. Okay. Soteriology is the study of salvation, okay? Uh, the Greek word at the base of that is soter, which is the word for sa savior uh, in Greek, all right? So when we read the Fathers of the Church, uh, when they're talking about really sometimes abstract and abstruse and complicated theological truths, um, for them, it's never just a matter of, hey, I'm a smart guy, I'm gonna make this thing as complicated as possible, all right? And so here's this really interesting thing that we could say about God and kind of logic chopping and that sort of thing. The fathers of the church never do this because they had this basic conviction that comes from Christ himself that says that what I believe is my access to salvation. I come to God, I come to salvation, I come to the life of heaven based on what I believe and how I know God. And so getting it right about what we believe about God and the human person and the church and all these things is not just a, it's not just a question of being in the Catholic truth club. It's a matter of being saved or not. And so that's why they will fight sometimes to the death about the truths of the faith. All right, I don't have time to go into too much of this, but there's a great example of this. When I, um, my first year of graduate theology school, um, I studied with a, a, an old church history professor named Cyprian Davis, who's a Benedictine monk, St. Meinrad, and he taught us church history. And he said that, uh, that he would go to say mass at these churches sometimes, and these churches had written their own creeds. And he goes, no, 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 we're not doing that because there's blood on this creed, and that's the creed we're going to say. And then he's talking about the Nicene Creed that we recite every Sunday. When you read the history of the Council of Nicaea, there's a rather famous story. I like to think that it's true, actually. So the great kind of dispute was between uh, a priest from Alexandria, so the same place as Origen, named Arius, okay? And he, very briefly, uh, basically said that, look, Jesus is God, but he's a sort of second level God after God the Father. And so God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit wasn't even like part of this conversation at this point. But they're different, they're not the same. He's a sort of lower level, you know, divinity somehow, all right? And you had theologians in the church, particularly people like Athanasius, again, that great name that comes up. Um, they say, no, 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 um, if, if Jesus is who he said he was, he's equal to the Father. And so they come up with this word in Greek, homoousios, which we translate as consubstantial, you know, okay? You've tripped over that, right, in saying Sunday Mass, right? Uh, but that's what, but that word is so important. You could translate it other ways. Like, even like before 2010, we used to say one in being with the Father, right? Okay, fine. But the word, the Latin translation of the Greek word, is consubstantial, and it's technical, and it's complicated, and it's for a reason, because it tells us something true about God. And it says the son is consubstantial. I mean, he's the same kind of thing that the father is. And there were fights about this. And so St. Nicholas, Santa Claus, all right? So Santa Claus is based on a bishop, um, uh, St. Nicholas of, not Smyrna, Myra, Myra, all right, um, in Turkey. And he was at the Council of Nicaea. And Arius was getting up, making these speeches like, no, 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 the son is not the same as the father. And St. Nicholas goes up and punches him in the face, all right? There's an actual account of this, it's later, fine, whatever, but oh man, I like that it's true, you know. Uh, and there's these great memes that go around at Christmas time as well about that, that you know, yeah, that I, yeah, I, I come to give gifts to kids and, and punch heretics in the face, I'm all out of gifts, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but that comes from a real event here, and, and so, and why would these bishops, these theologians, think it's even worth doing that? Are they just like, kind of hot-headed guys who get upset about who cares, whatever? No, no, no. They said, no, if our people, if the Christian people don't believe something true about God, they're not saved. And my job as a pastor is to make sure that these people are saved. And that's why this stuff's important. And that's why I'll spend my life doing it. And that's why I'll exile you if you don't think <laughs> what the church thinks, you know? And this is the story of the early church that way. All right, we could say lots more about all of this stuff, okay? Again, Father Will maybe do 700 years of history in like one talk, it's not fair, all right? <laughs> So I hope you have a bit more of a sense of what's going on here. Uh, if I can give you a book recommendation on this sort of stuff, I think it's really engaging. It's this book by a guy named Robert Louis Wilkin, W-I-L-K-E-N. 
and it's called The Spirit of Early Christian Thought. Dr. Wilkin taught at the University of Virginia for a long time, also at Notre Dame a different time. Uh, he's a convert, he was a Lutheran. Uh, he was uh, seminary classmates with uh, Richard John Newhouse. If anyone reads First Things here, that magazine, he founded that magazine, but they were classmates and they both became Catholic over time. And uh, so he's really one of the great kind of historians and theologians of the early church. And he wrote this book, The Spirit of Early Christian Thought, to kind of give a sense of what's the, not just like the facts and names and teachings and kind of history here, but like, what's the spirit of the thing? Like, how do we understand who the fathers are? So I haven't stolen too much from him tonight, so it won't, you know, it'll all be new. And he's much more eloquent than I am. Anyway, so uh, you can just remember a hoe, all right? Remember that, that's what the fathers of the church are, that they read the Bible differently than we do, and I think in a better way, and we wanna get into that, and that theology is all one for them, and that the whole point of all this, again, is not just to be smart, the truth club somehow, but it's that we can be saved, that God came to save us, and he's revealed himself so that we can be saved and live with him forever, that's the whole point, all right? So let's end there. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.